Um, I'll try to be quick to make up for the time and that we've already lost so the other speakers will have enough time and we have time for your questions as well. Um, as you already said, I'm going to talk about the neurobiology and neuropharmacology of psychedelic induced altered states of consciousness. So there are two main substances that I'll be talking about today. One is uh, psilocybin, the main active compound of the so-called magic mushrooms, and the other one is LSD. Um, they induce rather similar um, subjective symptoms, however, what is pretty different is their neuropharmacology. So, uh, psilocybin is a preferential serotonin 2A and 1A receptor agonist, however, LSD uh, has a much more diverse receptor profile, so it stimulates many serotonin as well as dopamine receptors. And this is going to be important for the results I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes. But first, let's quickly talk about what exactly these substances do. And um, I'm pretty sure you're, you're very familiar with, um, well, the substances in general. And for the effects, a lot of people are calling these substances hallucinogenes. And this slide here, I want to make a point that it is maybe not the right term for them. So. If you look at this picture of a wolf, what can happen at the substance, at the doses that we administer, at least in our studies, is that um, this picture might start to appear brighter. It might, uh, the colors might start to change. Um, it, things might start to get blurry, or will be moving around. Um, so these are not true hallucinations, right? They are more illusions, really. Um, and obviously these visual alterations are also not the only subjective effects that psychedelics are inducing, but there's much more which also includes things like alterations in self-experience, like um, experience of unity or blissful state or disembodiment um, and changes in the meaning of percept. So this is LSD, this is psilocybin. Um, the effects are pretty similar. And some of these effects are potentially therapeutically relevant. And that is, um, has been shown in quite a few studies so far. Um, these are just very few of, of the many um, first studies that have been published. Um, most of them are rather small. Um, and some of them don't include a placebo control. So we're still at the beginning, as we just heard in this previous talk, um, we're at the beginning of rediscovering the therapeutic effects of psychedelics right now. Um, and I'm not going to talk about these clinical effects here. Um, I'm going to talk about our studies that we did in healthy participants. Um, and why, well, why am I focusing on healthy participants when we all have all these nice clinical effects? Well, first of all, I think psychedelics offer the opportunity to investigate phenomena that are otherwise incredibly hard to study, like the subjective effects we just talked about, alterations in self-experience, for example. Um, and the other reason is that I think by increasing the understanding we have of these substances and one, what exactly they do in our body and our brain um, is helpful to uncover the full clinical potential. So the question I'm trying to answer today, um, at least a little bit, is what is the pharmacology and what is the neurobiology of psychedelics? And Again, as I mentioned in my very first slide, the pharmacology of LSD is pretty complex. So when we're talking about um, LSD, we know it stimulates various serotonin receptors and the dopamine receptors. So it is kind of hard to really understand, at least in humans, where the effects are coming from. So what we have done in this study is we use another substance which is called cadenserin. And cadenserin is able to more or less selectively just block this one receptor, the serotonin 2A receptor. That means if we administer cadenserin first, LSD can target all these other receptors, but not the serotonin 2A receptor. So basically, we then look at what effects are left, and these effects that are left 
don't, do not depend on the serotonin 2A receptor, whereas um, the effects that are gone, they probably depend on the serotonin 2A receptor. So that is our method of investigating the pharmacology of LSD. And those are the first results of this study. So again, we asked people in a questionnaire what they experienced. And what you can see here is, it's the same uh, questionnaire that I showed before. What you can see here in pink is LSD. So LSD is doing what LSD is supposed to do, nothing really exciting here. Um, then you see in green down here, placebo. Again, placebo is doing nicely what placebo is supposed to do, basically nothing. Um, so the interesting part here is really the yellow part, and you can hardly see it. And that is the interesting thing, because that means that cat cadenzolin basically blocks all LSD-induced effects um, that are subjectively perceivable. So that means um, that at least these subjective effects that we, at least to a certain degree, consider also therapeutically relevant depend on the stimulation of the serotonin to a receptor. And we also asked um, people, you know, basically during their trip, well, because sometimes, you know, in pharmacology it seems like, well, there's an early phase and there might be a late phase, that is what the animal literature told us. But at least at this dose of LSD, um, it is blocked completely from the beginning to the end. So then, obviously, we wanted to look at brain data. So, um, and a lot of people keep asking me, well, what does my brain look like? Um, when it's like when it's on LSD, and this is kind of the closest thing <laughs> I can show you here. Um, so what you can see here is uh, functional connectivity. So it's a, it's a um, special approach which is, which is called global functional connectivity. So that means that the colors you see here, the red colors, indicate that these parts of the brain are more strongly connected to the rest of the brain under the influence of LSD. Whereas the blue areas, those areas are less strongly connected. They're weakly connected um, to the rest of the brain under the influence of LSD. And there, I think there are two important things in this slide. The first is, um, well, the pattern of blue and red colors here. And what um, the people who are trained in neuroscience will easily notice that we have a pretty interesting differentiation between two networks. So the red areas that you see here and here and here are the ones which are responsible for our sensor for for working on our sensory input. So we have visual areas here, we have some somatomotor regions here. Um, so these are all sensory brain areas. And the blue areas here, they are responsible for integrating the sensory experiences. And intuitively, I think this makes a lot of sense because um, a psychedelic state is pretty much a very sensoric state. So we perceive a lot of information from our, from within ourselves as well as from the outside. But it seems to be differently integrated because these areas are very loosely connected. So we integrate the sensory perception and the sensory information differently, which kind of explains why we see ourselves new and why we see the world new and why it might have different meanings and why it might break up rigorous thinking patterns, which again might be important for therapeutic aspects. So this is the pattern we see here. The second interesting aspect that I was mentioning in the slide is again the pharmacology. So what you can see down here in these bar graphs, again, um, red is, uh, sorry, green is um, placebo, this is LSD, this is cadenzorin plus LSD. And what these figures down here basically tell you is um, that again, all these induced effects get blocked by cadenzorin. So we are not just talking about subjective effects, but the neuronal effects also seem to be highly dependent on the serotonin to A receptor. Now, as scientists, of course, we are usually not quite, you know, we, we want more and more and more proof, which I think is good, especially in psychedelic science. Um, we should acquire more data and we should um, see if data replicate. And here we used a different method um, to again investigate whether the serotonin to A receptor really is that important. And there is a data set which is derived from the Allen Human Brain Atlas. So what these people did is they had, well, post-mortem dead brains. 
and um, they extracted receptor gene expression um, from these dead brains. And we developed a method where we could use this data um, and map the receptor gene expression on the cortical surface. So basically, we ha this gives us an indication of which receptors are where in the brain. And what we did then is we correlated these maps that we had um, uh, where our particular receptors are with the functional connectivity maps we got from our fMRI data. And again, here we see serotonin 2A receptor correlates highly um, or the location of the serotonin 2A receptor correlates highly with the effects that we see induced by LSD. So another hint that the serotonin 2A receptor is really important. We also asked like, well, what exactly, so what functional alterations in the brain correlate with, you know, the subjective e effects that participants have been experiencing. And what we found here is that potentially the somatomotor system seems to be, um, or the functional connectivity within the somatomotor system seems to be very important for, um, for the subjectively induced effects. And again, I think that kind of makes a lot of sense um, about uh, something that I will come to in just a minute. Um, what I wanted to show here is that, well, if you're asking, well, you've seen that with LSD, right? So are you really sure that this has something to do with the psychedelic state? Because it might just be something that is interesting for um, LSD, but LSD is not the only substance inducing a psychedelic state. So we did exactly the same analysis with psilocybin as well. And as you can easily see here, um, the effects are very, very similar. So there's, it, it looks slightly different because um, here we have a different smoothing, so just a methods issue. Um, a slightly different smoothing pattern, but really the pattern that both substances are ge generating is literally the same. Um, so this gives us a good indication that this pattern of a differentiation between associative regions and sensory regions might actually underlie the psychedelic state. Then the other thing that we did is we looked at time-dependent effect because, um, I mean, basically all the studies that have been conducted so far contain some kind of mixture between when exactly things were, uh, data were collected. And also I think it kind of matters if we think about therapeutic approaches, when exactly, you know, what should we do when. Um, and what we did here is we scanned people 20, 20 minutes after administration um, 40 minutes and 70 minutes and what you can see here is that this pattern of effects, this differentiation again, sensory versus associative regions, nicely emerges over time. So it starts with um, uh, with alterations in the visual cortex, which is kind of aligns really nicely with what our participants tell us. So usually the first symptoms they notice are alterations in like, oh I can see the floor moving for example. Um, and then it gets stronger until we have like the full pattern emerged at um, 70 minutes after administration. So we also looked at, well, is there some way of how to predict how strongly people will react to a psychedelic? Because again, this might be interesting if we want to predict who will respond to psychedelics or not. And indeed, we could predict from their, um, from their baseline, so their placebo brain connectivity, um, this was correlated with the effects that psilocybin was inducing, especially after 70 minutes. So there might be a chance that we could scan people um, without any drugs on placebo or at baseline and try to predict from their, uh, from their brain connectivity at this stage how strongly they will be reacting to psychedelics. So, and the last bit that I wanted to show you is um, a model that um, Franz Vollenweider and Mark Geyer have been proposed um, more than 10 years ago, um, which is called the thalamic filter model. And um, f derived from animal studies, um, they said that there is a part of our brain which is called the thalamus, and the thalamus usually gates how much information and what information is sent to the cortex, and if it gets sent to the cortex, that usually means it's also perceived conscientiously. Um, and what they proposed is that under the influence of psychedelics, the thalamus doesn't well work that well anymore 
but its filtering function is disinhibited. So there is more information being um, being led to the cortex and therefore we are experiencing something they call sensory overload and this is basically the psychedelic state. Now with modern brain imaging techniques we for the first time had the, had the um, chance to actually test this model in humans. And what we did here is we had um, four brain regions which were interesting for this model and we used a technique called dynamic causal modeling which gives us in, in which gives us the opportunity to measure directed connectivity so if you remember the past results that I've shown um, so these were correlations with each other how strongly do these brain regions work together however with this technique we cannot look at the same at the whole brain at least for now but it gives us information on the directionality. And so that's basically what LSD does. And what we see here, indeed we have increased connectivity to certain cortical brain regions like the um, posterior cingulate cortex, which again is one, um, one brain region that various groups have been shown is highly influenced by psychedelics and has been correlated with alterations in self-experience. Uh, self so these cortical areas indeed um, seem to get more information from the thalamus, but there are also other cortical brain regions like the temporal cortex, and they get less information. So it doesn't seem like the thalamus is just sending information all over the brain, um, causing a big chaotic state, um, but it's rather sending more information to certain brain areas. And I think that kind of makes sense because for most people, um, the psychedelic state isn't necessarily chaotic at all. So, <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, to just sum this up, we have seen that LSD induced subjective and neuronal effects are highly dependent on the serotonin 2A receptor. We've seen that LSD and psilocybin both induce this increased integration of sensory and somatomotor networks, but at the same time reduce integration in associative regions. We have seen that alterations in the somatomotor network are associated with the subjective effects and that baseline um, uh, brain connectivity might predict the magnitude of psilocybin induced effects. And lastly, that alterations in directed connectivity are at least partially in line with the thalamic filter model. So um, that brings me back to, well, one of my first slides. So I really think that understanding how psychedelics work increases, first of all, our understanding of altered states of consciousness in general, and it increases our mechanistic and pharmacological understanding um, of these substances to really uncover their clinical potential. So thank you very much for your attention and of course thanks to all the people who have been involved in this research. Thank you very much, Katrin. Do we have any questions? Yes, Moat, please. Thank you for the talk, um, very interesting. Um, it's clear that 5 waves basically stops the team from doing what it's supposed to do. But does that necessarily mean that the other receptors don't play a role? Because, you know, for example, the D2 receptor, people talk about that it's important for the second phase, at least in the animal studies. Um, do you plan to check for that too? Yes, so to answer that question, we indeed have to do another study where we block one of these receptors. I think what we can tell from our study is that if you don't stimulate the serotonin 2A receptor, basically nothing happens. But that doesn't mean that the others don't have a modulatory effect. But we'd need more studies to answer this question. Yeah, the ideas, yeah, the ideas that we want to fill the gap. And I wanted to ask you about what you think this gap exists. And if it's necessary to fill it, that is all the molecules you mentioned, except the little sleep, which is weird, it's a bit strange, are tricky. And these are the molecules we are studying. Yeah. So I was studying DMT. And nobody uses more technology to study a vanilla dynamic mescaline, which is kind of even the most. Uh, the, the oldest psychedelic in Western culture and most of the molecules that 
people consume immigration and the Arab children are not the foreign adults are not being on and even they are more selective for the treatment of the center than the treatment of the questions. Why do you think that, that nobody yet did this? And if you think it's worth doing, because maybe, uh, yeah. Um, it's certainly worth doing. I think no one did it because we don't have any money to do that. Uh, <laughs> we find a way. one is they also have to reach a receptors in the developments. If, if they are, uh, yes, yeah. so serotonin 2A receptors are usually pretty widely distributed in the brain, so you find them pretty much everywhere, but sometimes in a higher and sometimes in a lower concentration. Um, how, how does ketamine compare to atypical antipsychotics? I mean, could we achieve the same effect with, for example, olanzapine? Um, well, we don't know. <laughs> we should try. Um, but so ketamine is the most selective we can go in um, in humans. They're more selective compounds, but they are only allowed to be used in animals. So that's why we chose um, ketanserin because of its uh, selectiveness for the serotonin 2A receptor. But of course, olanzapine. I mean, we, we'd have to try. There was a question in the back. Uh, I thank you first of all for your talk. Uh, I have a question regarding Kethanzerin. Given that we know that it reduces up to suppresses or makes these subjective defects disappear, right? I just have to start wondering why that is not a standard thing that we are having to people experiencing problems with that particular drug. Because it seems mm -hmm. to me like 1 plus 1 equals 2. So medical professionals do not tell me that they do that. Yes, um, and I think there, there are reasons for that. Um, for example, well, if you think about, um, so you're talking about acute fear and anxiety under the influence of LSD, and then using ketanserin to stop the trip. Um, so I think there are multiple issues. So first of all, if you administer it orally, you'd have to administer high doses and you have to wait 60 minutes until it has effect. So you'd have to in administer it intravenously at a rather high dose, which you theoretically can do. But imagine someone being in the state of severe anxiety and then just you know pushing them out of it. I think this can probably be much more traumatizing than administering a benzodiazepine and you know letting them experience how the fear slowly goes away and how they you know can finish the trip and nothing bad happened instead of just pulling someone out of a situation like this and leaving them with you know these traumatizing experience. Yeah. 